All right. Um, so it looks like it's time for our uh, webinar on vector symbolic architectures and hyperdimensional computing uh, to begin. So 8 p.m. GMT. And my name is Evgeny Ospo. So today we have two exciting talks. Uh, one by uh, Tony Plate and another one by um, Pax and Freddy. Uh, so very soon I will hand over uh, the microphone to, to, uh, to them. Uh, just a short announcement. Uh, we have one more webinar uh, uh, before summer break. So on 20, uh, 27th of uh, July, two exciting talks. Uh, so stay tuned uh, and uh, during August I will contact uh, people uh, from the list of not presenting uh, presented uh, presented people and uh, ask them to contribute to the uh, uh, autumn session uh, of our webinar so uh, that's it for my uh, um, for myself so I'm handing the word to Tony plate Tony, please, I'm muting myself. Okay, thank you, Evgeny, and, and thank you so much for um, putting this together and giving us all the, the opportunity to present and, and hear what other people have to say. Um, okay, so in this talk, I wanna look at the interplay of concern with statistical and symbolic structure in the, in the history of attempts to enable computers to understand human language and reasoning. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, I'm gonna identify vector symbolic architectures as a direction for unifying the ability to deal with statistical and symbolic structure in language and in representing and manipulating conceptual structure in general. Um, I'm going to be somewhat speculative and try to be a little provocative and I'll also be asking more questions than providing answers, so please indulge me. Um, okay, in the very first years of attempts to use programmable computers to process human language, the focus was, providing on a, a, was on providing a rough machine translation that could speed up the work of a human translator. Uh, and in 1951, Joshua Bar Hillel, one of the first mathematicians and linguists to work on machine translation, saw statistical methods as the only way to proceed. Um, this is a quote from a, from a history by, um, by Hutchins. The, the intriguing thing to me here is, is that he identified n-gram statistics, which would later go on to become very widely used as the way forward. Uh, however, these early approaches did not achieve the hope for success, and it was not to be until the late 1980s that statistical methods for machine translation started achieving notable success uh, using the Canadian Parliament proceedings as a parallel corpora. In the meantime, led by Noam Chomsky, there had been great progress in creating formal mathematical grammars for human languages. In the late 1960s, Elaine Colmoreau created created prolog to encode formal grammars for, for language into logic-based rules. And these rules could then be used by a logic programming system to automatically parse natural language sentences. This approach focused almost entirely on the syntactic structure of language and completely eschewed any need for statistics. There was much excitement about these techniques for language processing and AI in general. The Japanese government funded a huge 10-year fifth generation computing project started in 1982. However, again, the success was elusive. In the face of the continual and, and widespread variation in how, in how people use language and grammars and the subtleties of meanings of words and phrases, structural grammars for language turned out to be extremely difficult to construct, too brittle and too prone to misunderstanding to be genuinely useful. Another thread of research focused on understanding human cognition via understanding how the human brain works at a neural level. In 1976, Maher and Poggio published the tri-level hypothesis, which was later published in Maher's 1982 book entitled Vision. This hypothesis claimed that any information processing system could and should be understood at three different levels, the computational, the representational and algorithmic, and the implementational. Take the example of a cash register. At the computational level, there is a theory of arithmetic. At the level of representation and algorithm, we would have the methods of representation of numbers, should they be base 10 or binary. And 
And at that level, the algorithms for addition. And finally, at the hardware level, we have the implementation. Is it metal wheels, digital logic circuitry, or some other mechanism? Another example is language. In their 1976 paper, Maharan Podgia referred to Chomsky's grammatical theory, suggesting that competence in language, that is what's considered correct usage, should be understood at the computational level, while performance, that is actual usage, what people actually do, should be understood at the, alg at the algorithmic level. Mara's tri-level hypothesis has been ubiquitous and extremely influential in cognitive science and language processing. As, as, well as, in neuro, as well as in neuroscience. So looking at language understanding at the computational level and thinking about what is being computed, it seems clear that structure is essential. There are wide varieties of type of linguistic structure that matter. There's the simple grammatical structure of individual sentences involving things like attachment, role filler bindings, reference, tenses, and more and the way that a sentence is parsed can depend on the meaning of the words in the sentence. Time flies like an arrow, seems straightforward with flies being a verb, until we hear the sentence, fruit flies like a banana, where now, like is, seems like the, a good choice for the verb here, and different understandings of both sentences open up. There's also structure of the semantics of the words and concepts. The meaning of a sentence is not just the sum of its parts. It's definitely not the sum in a sense that an unordered bag of, of an unordered bag of words or the addition of semantic feature vectors, but it's not even the sum if we take syntax into account. Having a dictionary and a grammar of English is not sufficient to understand many sentences. Knowledge about the world is also essential, as these examples from Rhodey's 2002 thesis show. If we didn't see these sentences together, most of us probably wouldn't even think of any alternate possibility other than something like the baby goes to sleep after crying for a long time and the dog is put out of its misery after a long illness. Interpretation of the con conventional structure of the sentence, taking world knowledge into account, just comes naturally and unconsciously. The importance of structure is not limited to the phrase structure of individual sentences or the structural preferences of individual words. Blackhoff and Johnson's book, Metaphors We Live By, argues that metaphor is everywhere in language. They claim that many complex concepts are understood by metaphorical relations with other concepts and that these metaphors are productive. They're not limited to a small number of frozen idiomatic phrases. There are many metaphors based on spatial orientation, like the more is more is up, less is down metaphor. So examples are my income rose. If you're too hot, turn the heat down. Another spatial metaphor, good is up, bad is down. Things are at an all time low. He does high quality work. Another spatial metaphor, conscious is up, unconscious is down. Wake up, he dropped off to sleep. He sank into a coma. Then there are very common metaphors based on speaking of something in terms of a journey or a war. Love is a journey. Look how far we've come. We can't turn back now. We've come a long way together. We've gotten off the tracks. An argument is a journey. He strayed from the line of argument. Do you follow my argument? You're going around in circles. An, argu an argument is a war. Your claims are indefensible. His criticisms were right on target. He shot down all my arguments. So why does this matter? When people think of metaphor or analogy, they often think of thought-provoking metaphors in poetry, like Juliet is the Sun, or hard-to-understand SAT analogy puzzles, like medicine is to illness, ass, choose one of the following, hunger is to thirst, law is to anarchy, etc. Earlier in this workshop, Ross Scaler presented a very elegant model of a system using vector representations to find analogical mappings. At the end, in response to a question, Ross remarked that humans tend to be very poor at structure mapping. However, by Lakoff and Johnson's account, metaphors are more than rare, poetic, and difficult to understand. Metaphors are everywhere and help structure how we think. People use them all the time, rapidly and unconsciously. The additional structure that metaphors provide should in fact make language understanding and learning easier, not harder. In terms of machine learning, additional structure should mean fewer parameters and faster training with less data. If we know that a collection of words can be used to describe spatial position, 
then we can easily understand what the same words mean when applied to dimensions like quantity, goodness, consciousness, and emotionality versus rationality. Okay, so moving forward to um, neural networks now. One of the first attempts to process linguistic structure in neural networks was by Jeff Allman in, in 1990. Allman tackled three fundamental problems. One, what is the nature of linguistic representations? Two, how can complex structural relations such as constituents be represented? Three, how can a, the apparently open-ended nature of language be accommodated by a fixed resource system? So Allman built a, rel by modern, current standards, a, an extremely simple network and trained it on 40,000 sentences generated from an artificial grammar over 23 words. The results were intriguing. Similar words had similar representations and similar sentences had similar trajectories through the hidden unit space. The system could handle a, a level of recursion as well, that is nested phrases, with the, with the trajectory for nested phrases being transformed visibly similar to the trajectory for non-nested for non-nested sentences. Okay, so in the last couple of years, there have been several deep learning neural networks that have achieved remarkable success in a range of language processing tasks. These have been massive networks with hundreds of millions of parameters trained on vast data sets. These networks like GP2, GPT-2 and GPT-3 and BERT have become the basis for many successful techniques, both in providing representations for words, word embeddings, um, it's another term for vector representations, and also using the whole network to perform tasks such as translation and question answering. And in the past couple of years, these have just become the dominant way of, of, um, of, of, of tackling these language tasks and of on benchmarks are outperforming all other, all other techniques. But even though these systems are achieving such high level of performance, e even their creators don't claim that the systems are really understanding language. Douglas Hofstadter, the uh, author of Gödel Escher Bach, dis discusses this in, in an article, The Shallowness of Google Translate, how these systems are a long way from real understanding and are relatively easy to trick. He gives Lots of interesting examples of failures in translation that give insight into, into you know, how, they, how the system's failing to understand, a couple of which I've shown here. In the first sentence, in their house, everything comes in pairs. There's his car and her car, his towels and her towels, and his library and hers. In the translation of this, the elegant his-her parallelism is lost, and the round trip, which is not shown here, becomes garbled. In the second English sentence, one swallow does not thirst quench. The French translation here is of the bird sense of swallow, which really doesn't make much sense. And the latter part of the sentence is a mess, though um, curiously enough, the round trip back to English is mostly sensible. Hofstadter giving, giving a, um, a, longer, a longer passage uh, translated automatically from Chinese to English comments to my mind, because the above paragraph contains no meaning, it's not in English. It's just a jumble made of English ingredients, a random word salad, an incoherent hodgepodge. And Hofstadter's right, the system is not understanding, but I would claim its output is more than just a jumble of ingredients. It's actually a beautiful salad. Salads can have a lot of structure, both in terms of the proportions and balances of their ingredients and the physical arrangement of those ingredients. It feels like that's what these systems are doing, getting the proportions of the ingredients correct, getting the distributional semantics balanced, and then arranging, arranging the words in an order that approximates the structure that is associated with real understanding. And doing all of this goes a surprisingly long way to constructing a simulacrum of human performance and scoring well on benchmarks. Okay, I just wanna briefly mention distributed semantic vector representations for, for words, which at least at the first and second level can be viewed as feature-based semantics. There have been a number of very successful approaches to deriving this sort of structure from data. So for example, latent semantic, semantic indexing, random indexing, word to vec. In this forum um, a few weeks ago, Alec Kelly talked about what information is gleaned from different levels of distributional associations. 
all of these techniques provide word vectors, um, also called embeddings. These embeddings have very useful properties, capturing a lot of the semantic stru similarity structure in the dot product similarity of the vectors, and have found wide use in language processing tasks. But what's missing? Structure, specifically, we're missing the ability to keep track of entities, what we know about them and the relationships among them, and the ability to represent and manipulate structure. Back to Mara's tray level hypothesis. At the top level, we're clearly working with structure. Um, at the computational level, some sort of representation of symbolic structure and algorithmic manipulation of that structure seems essential to the computations that humans do all the time in an effortless manner. Furthermore, without the constraints of symbolic structure, the data requirements for learning all the regularities of human thought and language would seem unreasonable. This is the, this is the same argument that Chomsky made. So if we want to avail ourselves of the power of distributed vector representations and learning in neural networks, how could we perform these types of systematic symbolic operations on vector representations? One of the first papers to clearly describe this problem and, and investigate possible solution was Hinton's 1990 AI journal paper on Hartol hierarchies. Hinton talks about the network attending to different levels of hierarchical structure. Graham Bent gave a different, gave a great demonstration of this kind of Hartol structure traversal in this workshop two weeks ago by representing all the, the scenes and speeches in Shakespeare's Hamlet in fixed width vectors that could be constructed and unpacked hierarchically. Okay, so in 1990, Smolensky was the first to propose role filler bindings implemented by tensor products as a way to represent structure. But a problem with that approach was that vector dimensions grew exponentially with repeated binding or depth of hierarchy. Since these foundational papers of Hinton and Smolensky in 1990, there's been a variety of work done on how compositional and hierarchical structure could be encoded in fixed width vectors, some of it coalescing around the name vector symbolic architectures. These ideas have, been, are, have now been around for going on 30 years, and I'm newly excited by the prospect of applying them, because to apply them successfully, I think we need lots of language data and infrastructure like good word embeddings, and we have that now. Um, I won't try to describe all the details of VSAs here, but I do want to call out several aspects. Using two primary operations, binding and bundling, we can bind variables and represent compositional structure and even hierarchical structure. There's a lot of variety in the various VSA schemes, but I suspect that the com commonalities are more important than the differences. So VSAs have five essential operations. Some ske schemes may um, have some extras. Um, the first is bundling. Uh, this is typically superposition or vector addition. The second is binding. How can we, how can we bind um, variables and values or roles and fillers? And this is typically done with some form of vector multiplication. The third is unbinding, which is the inverse of binding. Um, it's possibly approximate. The fourth is a similarity computation, which is almost always something like dot product or cosine. And then the fifth is a cleanup memory. In the, in, the, in the vector space that we're using, there's also a lot of variety. The elements there, may, it might be real valued, complex valued, um, or binary. And there's, there's other possibilities, but these are the most common. In terms of vector algebra, bundling is simple, and it's usually implemented with vector addition. Bundling is usually commutative and preserves similarity, so that A plus B is similar to both A and to B. Binding is the operation that's special to VSAs. It is like some form of vector multiplication. It may or may not be commutative, commutative, and it randomizes similarity, so that A times B is usually not similar to either A or B, though this can be engineered. Unbinding is the inverse operation, and depending on the type of binding and or the nature of the vectors, binding may be self-inverse, and the unbinding may be exact or approximate. Many binding operations can be expressed as a matrix vector multiplication, so that where A and B are vectors, and A times B is the binding, then A times B is equal to a matrix M times B, where that matrix is equal to F of A, and F is a function that maps n-dimensional vectors onto n by n matrices. This is true for convolution, randomized binding, and others. 
This matrix multiplication equivalence also includes operations like element-wise shift and permutation. The importance of this observation is that when this is true, we can use linear algebra to manipulate binding and bundling formulas to calculate expected results. And given this ability, we can engineer how we construct representations so that they have the desired properties. Okay, what I want to propose as the linear VSA manifesto is that conceptual structure can be packed into vector representations using vector addition and an invertible linear multiplication operation for binding. The details of the bundling and binding operations don't matter that much for the higher levels of understanding, though they might be important for the implementation. What is important is that the, binding and the, the bundling and the binding operations are linear. This makes it possible to reliably engineer structural operations and their effect on similarities of representations because the operations obey simple rules of linear algebra and linear mappings can preserve existing feature structure. This is not so different to many prior proposals, but the emphasis is on working with linear operations because of the many benefits that linear operations bring and on abstracting over the details of the vector representation and binding operations because most are going to have similar properties for large vectors. Okay, I want to wrap up with several questions and a suggestion. First is, how much structure do we really need to represent and manipulate in order to solve simple metaphor and analogy problems? Um, I've seen three levels of complexity to, of, of the approach to working with, with problems like analogical similarity. Um, at the most complex level in my own work in, in 1995, I was constructing vector representations in a pretty complex way for nested compositional structures and engineering them so that the dot product similarity reflected the structural similarity. Um, Canova in 2010 took a simpler approach and solved analogy problems from structures represented as roll filler bindings. So we could answer questions like, what is the dollar of Mexico by using unbinding and, and binding operations? At the simplest level, Levy and Goldberg and Mikhailov showed that many analogy problems could be solved just using word embeddings created by systems like word to vec and just by addition and subtraction. So the result was that they could answer analogy questions just by adding and subtracting vector. So that if you took the embedding for king and subtracted the embedding for man and added the embedding for woman, then you would get a vector that was most similar to queen. So my question here is, which level is the simplest level of structural representation and, manipul and manipulation needed to be able to process these kind of problems and to be able to exploit metaphorical relations amongst concepts to make it easy for computers to understand utterances like his feelings sank in terms of the up-down spatial metaphor. Okay, next just wanted to briefly talk about the interesting data sets. A lot of on a, on a lot of these big data sets, these, these techniques that we know don't understand can still do really well. Um, and data has always been a major driver of progress in, in language processing techniques, from information retrieval systems to, to statistical NLP to latent semantic indexing, um, word to vec embeddings, and finally to these transformer-style deep learning neural networks. We can always train methods on large text corpora, but the methods that don't explicitly attempt to deal with compositional hierarchy or hierarchical structure and, don't, and that don't seem equipped with any ability to manipulate structure, they still perform at remarkably high levels, from bag of word techniques um, to word to vec embedding to transformer networks. But there are data sets specially constructed to test deep understanding. They're handcrafted and, and comparatively small. Um, the Winograd schemas and Winograde tests. And so what these do is, is they construct pairs of sentences where differences in a single word changes the reference of a pronoun. So one sentence would be the city councilman refused the demonstrators a permit because they feared violence. The city councilman refused the demonstrators a permit because they advocated violence. In the first sentence, they refers to the council members. In the second, they refers to the demonstrators. Figuring this out requires understanding of the different possible parse structures of the sentences and integrating that with world knowledge. So Levesque intended these to be tests of understanding that are 
They're easily disambiguated by the human reader. So ideally, the readers don't even notice the ambiguity. They're not solvable with simple techniques such as selectional restrictions, and they're Google-proof. There's no obvious, no obvious statistical tests that can reliably distinguish them. There were originally 160 of um, now 273 pairs of these hand constructed ones, but they've been found not so good for testing deep understanding because neural language models can now reach around 90% accuracy based on things like distributional biases. So Kaisuki Sagaguchi and co-authors have created a, a, another data set called the Winner Grande data set. Um, and these, these are using automatic, automatic methods to reduce the biases that, that make these problems somewhat easy to solve. And they've got, to, um, they've got a, a set of 44K problems now, and humans get around 94% accuracy, the best machine models get 60 to 80%. Okay, so this brings me to my final suggestion. A big opportunity for VSAs might be in working out how to use the VSA vocabulary of operations for directing attention to different aspects of structure in order to construct and manipulate com complex concepts. The major breakthrough in neural networks for language processing over the last few years has come from transformer networks, which use an attention mechanism that can learn to pay attention to the appropriate prior import or hidden layer when processing at a particular point in the sequence. This architecture is the basis of networks such as GPT-2 and GPT-3 and BERT and related networks. In Hinton's 1990 paper on part-hole hierarchies, attention plays a central role in Hinton's formulation. Attention determines whether we focus on a whole or one of its parts. What we pay attention to is loaded into memory. When a part is loaded into memory, it becomes the whole. So it's curious that the exact, the exact mechanism of attention that's used in transformer networks actually seems to closely resemble some VSA operations. There's something that looks like a binding hidden layer representations by matrix multiplication followed by dot product computation of vector similarities, followed by a softmax selection of vectors for maximum with the, to, to find the one with the maximum similarity. And finally a, finally, a bundling together of the vectors in proportion to their softmax weights. So, you know, I'm, I'm wondering whether there's some way that we can engineer in a more specific um, structure manipulation abilities to give these, these networks some more power. So that's where I'd like to leave things and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Tony, for this excellent talk. Uh, so we still have uh, some few minutes to, for uh, quick questions or commentaries. Uh, this time, so to save time um, uh, from typing into chat, so you know you all know the rules. So you you please uh, unmute your microphone, and if you have something to say, so just uh, shout loud. Anybody? Hi, Tony. It's Dennis. I, I have maybe a silly question, but why do you think you've presented the three types, different types of approaching analogy? Why do you think the simplest one right now is the most dominating one in the community? Uh, you're asking why I think it's the most dominant? Yeah, yes. Exactly. I think because it's simple and it, and it, actually, it actually performs. Uh, yeah, the level of performance that comes out of it that I, that I see in the papers is, is you know, like 40 to, to 60%. So it's, it's, performing, it's performing pretty well, but it's, it's not... Um, you know, it's it's far below what human performance is, and I, I think it's I think it's just people like it because it's simple, and that's a good reason to like it. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. You know, when I when I saw that approach, I I thought you know it's it's thought provoking because I I was much more focused on on you know giving really giving the networks the 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 ability to, to manipulate that structure in a way that I thought made sense. But then, you know, it's challenging to see 
Well, actually, a much simpler approach can can get a long way. So, you know, that, so I think that's that that's worth that's worth thinking about. You know, what how much complexity do we really need, and where's the right place to put the complexity? All right. Um, maybe a very uh, uh, last comment or question. So, ten seconds. Um, if not, um, I would like to remind you to use, uh, I will have a question in the chat uh, from Alex. Uh, the transformer network is pretty much a BSA model alternating layers with a more typical neural network, if I understand it right. So it seems like there is a lot of potential for BSA deep learning hybrid systems. A command, do you have a? Yeah, I would. Um, I I think that's an intriguing possibility. Yeah. I yeah, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where to take it. But these these networks are are really learning pretty amazing things, and that's one of the reasons that I go back to advocating for 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 just these kinds of linear binding operations because those those can be put easily and directly into the learning networks. Uh, in line with the, with uh, with your last comment, Tony, um, I um, uh, we did um, recently a work where, uh, or th there are several publications showing that BSA representations are pretty much compatible with neural networks. Uh, I mean, so you can use VSA encoded structures for learning. My question, or I mean for myself uh, rather, but uh, also to you and community. So you can learn based on encoded VSAs, VSA representations, but um, it seems pretty much complex to uh, do the changes to VSA encodings. So uh, the question is, um, uh, so the engineering versus learning uh, of semantical structure. So, yeah, what do, you, what do you mean by the changes to, to VSA encoding? So, uh, I mean, you, uh, when design uh, a representation, so you, you kind of engineer the structure, semantical structure. Mm. Yeah, you learn on this engineer's structure, so you you try to find correlation so through your corp, uh, te uh, text corpus. But what if your uh, engineer structure uh, needs to be modified as a result? So you understand that maybe it's not correct. Or so it's that's yeah. So that's where I see the these attention mechanisms as being as being very useful because with the attention mechanism. So we don't actually have that many different operations in VSAs. There's like, you know, basically binding and unbinding. So both of those can be computed and the output made available. And then the network can learn which of the one is the right, is the, is the right one to pay attention to and to incorporate into the next step of the computation. That's, that's sort of the direction I'm thinking. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Tony, once again. Uh, so we move on to the next speaker.